Hey everybody and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Welcome to our podcast where we bring you the most inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and experts in the software development industry. Now each week we interview successful leaders who share their unique journeys and valuable insights. I'm your host Barry and today we're very lucky to have a remarkable guest joining us. Dan Turchin, who is CEO at People Rain. Hello, Dan. Welcome to the podcast. Very good to be here. Thanks for having me. Pleasure's all mine. So firstly, thank you so much for taking time out with me today. I know you're very busy. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company you work at? Yeah, People Rain is the AI platform that automates the delivery of employee service for some of the most large, the largest, most respected organizations on the planet. And our mission is to positively impact how the next billion employees do work. And we do that by creating an AI-first platform with four applications built on top of it that gives every employee back about four to six hours of productive time per week. It's kind of like if, uh, if every employee around the world were to get their very own world-class personal assistant. And uh, it's the culmination of about, oh gosh, Close to three decades of work that uh, me and my teams have done. People Rain is actually the seventh company that I've been involved with in and around the space of applying AI and machine learning to improving work life. And uh, I'm no stranger to the microphone. My passion project is I, I host a podcast called AI and the Future of Work. We've published about 300 episodes over five seasons, and we have a community of about a million listeners. So these are all topics that uh, I'm very passionate about and eager to share a little bit of my perspectives with uh, with your audience. I felt lovely and I recommend everyone go and watch that. It's very interesting. Can you just talk to us a little bit about your journey um, and just how your company came into existence? I got started a long time ago out of undergrad. My first job was with the Walt Disney Company. I was an industrial engineer and I love my job and I love that company so much and it frustrated me that there was a big tax that I put, that I paid as, as part of being an employee on my productivity. And it involved just a bunch of things where, you know, get, kind of you get up in the morning, you look at your calendar, and there's some stuff that just saps your energy. And then there's other stuff you're like, wow, today's going to be awesome. Like, I get to do that thing. And I realized over time that I had so much more to give to the company than it was capable of receiving from me because of all these compliance tasks and forms that needed to fill, be filled out and videos I needed to watch and boxes I needed to check. So when I had an opportunity to start to think about designing a world of work where, you know, me, a junior industrial engineer at a big company like Disney and, and every other, you know, version of me doing partly the thing they love and partly the thing they don't love, you know, what if we could change that world of work for them? Wouldn't that be an amazing, amazing world to you know, bring my kids into and, you know, if we could bring that vision to fruition, I really felt like, uh, you know, that was meaningful work. And that became my why. I really believe that's, that's why I was put on this planet is to really make it possible for every employee to go to work and do the best work of their lives unconstrained by some of that kind of friction that exists between them and their employers. I've watched a lot of your videos and it comes, you're, you're obviously very passionate about AI and understandably so. Do you have any doubts about or any, any um, challenges about where AI will be going in the future or do you wholly embrace it? I believe that in the next three years, work will change more than it has in the past 300. Since the days of the, uh, the machine breakers in your great country, uh, the first industrial revolution in the 18th century. Um, work patterns have been largely static. And now all of a sudden, we're on the cusp of this era when you walk into work and it just may be the case that your colleague is a bot. And it's the first time in kind of the history of modern labor, we're actually confronting, you know, at an existential level, like what it means to work, what it means to be a human. And yeah, of course, I have concerns. A lot of what we discuss in the podcast is around the ethics of AI and what it means to exercise AI responsibly. But I'm firmly on Team Human. And I believe that uh, as Team Human, um, we're very capable of using this important moment in history to really define a new relationship that benefits humanity and 
Ironically, I firmly believe that we can use technology to humanize work. For every one job that might be lost due to automation, I believe three will be created. And it does involve, you know, a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of creative thinking, and a little bit of rule breaking to make that happen. But for as much as I'm concerned about what could go wrong, I'm very optimistic about what could go right. And I believe as a community, it's incumbent on us to start asking all those important questions. And I believe we'll get there, but it's going to take some work and we do need to be aware of what could go wrong. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're optimistic. It gives me some uh, reassurance about the future. Do you think we're ready as a society? I think the technology's there, but is the is the like the audience? Are, are we ready as a, as a as a species? It's a great question, and I like that you used the word species because uh, I often cite a great book by a great author named Yuval Noah Harari, who talks about Homo Deus as potentially the evolution of our species. And uh, this idea that there may be, you know, a new, a new deity, a new, I won't say religion, but a new faith, and that could be determined by our relationship with machines. And I, I believe in that at, at a philosophical level, that we're ready to confront what it means to be human. And I really, I celebrate the fact that this era is an opportunity for a wake-up call for everyone that's stuck in a job that what I say involves the three D's. It's dull, it's dirty, or it's dangerous. There are a lot of jobs out there that humans are meant to do just to earn a living, to put food on the table that I don't believe are good jobs for humans. And so now's a great time for all those humans trapped doing these functions that really are better done by machines to think, you know what? Is this why I was put on the planet? You know, maybe there's a better use of my skills. Maybe Maybe now's the right time for me to reskill, upskill, you know, think about doing something that will preserve my, my, my body for more years or, you know, not put me in harm's way. So I, I believe that this is a time when being forced to ask the question is really important. And the complacency that, you know, the last decades, centuries, et cetera, have uh, afforded us, I don't think that's a good thing. I actually think it's really important that these technologies are catalyzing these conversations that perhaps we should have been having for a long time. But I think there's a net benefit to humanity, the fact that we could get humans back to doing hum work that humans should do. So going back uh, to the company itself, um, what kind of tech trends are you currently uh, ca currently catching your, your attention and are like driving factors behind this difference? Yeah, I'd say more than a tech trend, what I see happening, I'm, I'm sitting talking to you here today in the cradle of Silicon Valley. So kind of within a five mile radius of, uh, of where I am right now, a lot of you know, really interesting innovations are happening. Um, and if there's one um, fair criticism, well, fair is subjective, but uh, of what we do in Silicon Valley is I'd say we do a lot of navel gazing. And when, you know, it's an awful cliche, but when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So out here, everything looks like a problem that technology can solve. Some of them can be solved by technology, others can't. But in terms of the the, the problems that I see that are good candidates for technology and what, what makes me excited, certainly about what we're doing at PeopleRain, is the fact that it's forcing us to have a conversation about where technology can and shouldn't, uh, should and shouldn't uh, intervene more in our lives. And so I'll give you a couple examples, like technology being used to help uh, paraplegi paraplegic patients, let's say, walk again or regain use of their limbs amazing use of technology. Human brain interfaces, where, whereby things like what uh, Musk's Neuralink is doing that could potentially, you know, give, let's say, you know, advanced stage ALS patients, you know, back their full faculties. Like these are things that we can actually do. Believe it or not, a lot of them are data problems. And if we can train neural nets or, or models using, you know, amazingly powerful machines and technology to fix some of those you know, real, you know, modern plagues. Um, I think that's a great use of technology. Um, I think we always have to ask, what's the end game? If if we think that this is a problem worth solving with technology, you know, are we solving the problem of getting pet food to your door the next day? If so, maybe, you know, as pure capitalists, maybe that's okay. But I think it's important to say, you know, what's the end game? And is this an important enough problem for humanity 
to be solving. And I, I'm, I'm passionate about what my team at Peep Brain is doing because we constantly ask ourselves, is this a problem that's worth solving and is this the right way to solve it? And I think as long as we get comfortable as technologists, first asking, you know, what's the end game and is this the right tool to use to, you know, address this problem, then I think, you know, as a community of technologists, then we'll be headed in the right direction. But, but I do fear, you know, to an earlier question, I do fear that there's not enough, we don't spend enough time thinking through the potential implications of some of the technology that we unleash. And if we could harness the power of, you know, creativity and ingenuity and the power of technology to spend more time solving the right problems, I think we'd see, you know, catalyze the benefits to humanity that we've been talking about. Yeah, I remember watching Jurassic Park one time, and there's a, a guy called Dr. Ian Malcolm, and you may know what I'm going to say here. And one of the famous lines I always remember is something along the lines of, we need to ask ourselves, just because we can, should we, um, in, in terms of science? It sounds like maybe that's the same school of thought as you. I've never met Michael Crichton, but gosh, so much of, uh, of what was in that movie is prophetic. It starts to seem like... Uh, an allegory about artificial intelligence, right? Whether they're raptors or uh, or bots or or uh, you know LLMs roaming unchecked. When we stop asking the question, what could go wrong? Uh, we can very very quickly be eaten by raptors. I think it's a, v- a very appropriate uh, analogy, Barry. When you're looking through your history and and all the achievements that you've done, is there anything that stands out as a moment that was particularly challenging or a moment that you regret? I frequently say that. People reign our only currency is customer value. And so when I think about what's ahead for us and when I think about our accomplishments to date, I always think about it in terms of how much value have we created for people. And I recall a story early in the days of People Rain when I had a, a great opportunity to visit a contact center using People Rain uh, in the Philippines. And I met this amazing woman, this kid out of college, who was uh, uh, tasked with responding to every inquiry that came into the call center. Uh, within one minute. And literally, there was a, a stopwatch that would start ticking on her screen. And I felt my blood pressure rise just sitting there watching poor Yvonne struggle to try to hit the buzzer, you know, before the minute the, 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 the sand in the hourglass ran out. And she was very uh, underskilled, underprepared to do her job. And I showed her how she would be using people rain, the capabilities of live coaching. It would tell her interactively uh, how to fix the problem the right way the first time by uh, surfacing the right knowledge in the form of a set of next best actions. And she got off a call. Uh, she had no idea how to fix a BlackBerry, which for those young listeners, it's actually, at one point, it was a, a mobile device, uh, more than a fruit. Uh, poor Yvonne didn't know, but I showed her how people Rain would, would, would walk her through the process of resetting the APN setting on a BlackBerry. And she hung up the phone. She got credit for uh, fixing the problem within the first minute. And uh, she had tears coming down her eyes and she hugged me. And I'll never forget that, that that's why we do what we do is, you know, how many millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of Yvonne's are out there um, whose life could be better with amazing technology. And all of the, all of the achievements, all of the, the great moments, all of the inspiration that we derive from doing what we do, it all comes back to a Yvonne whose who's very real journey we can point to and say, you know, we, we made that one life a little better. I feel like you're one of the most passionate people about AI, but someone who also like really cares about uh, the individual in a human sense. And it's it's nice that you've got that kind of combination. Is it hard to get that right balance uh, between progressing technology and trying to make it so that it doesn't become oppressive to human needs? There's a small community of AI optimists who feel like if we are smart enough as a species to create this amazing technology, we're also smart enough to pull the plug when something goes wrong. And I think if you always keep in mind, you know, the principles of ethics and what our, you know, our great power, our great responsibility, you know, requires us to do, I think it's really easy to have this kind of ethical framework to guide the development of the technology. The second we think, you know, more about, you know, uh, to use your analogy, you know, how many tickets can we sell to Jurassic Park, you know, without thinking about the fact that we're breeding dinosaurs, you know, the, uh, the more dangerous it can get. And so me and my team are driven every day by feeling a genuine sense of, of obligation 
to be able to be a, a role model for other companies to think about the right way to deploy AI, be very wary of its power, but also always balance kind of um, what it can do with, to your point, what it should do, um, and make sure that we're providing kind of a steady stream of, of positive examples of how the technology can be used for good. Um, and the more we can grow that community of people who I believe, you know, approach AI challenges through that right kind of ethical framework, um, ultimately, to me, that's the that's the enduring value that that people in will create. So you may be very excited about people who are listening to what you're saying. So can you just tell us a little bit more about like, some of your primary focal points and ongoing projects or endeavors? Yeah, so we're a mission-driven organization, very focused on our values. But we also are very pragmatic in our approach to deploying AI uh, to solve the kinds of problems that I talked about. So PeopleRain is an AI platform delivered as a SaaS service, software as a subscription service. And what it does is it automates the resolution of all the, quote, the, the friction points that exist at work. So these are sometimes very mundane kinds of things. It's, you know, I need to reset my password or, you know, I need to get my kid on my benefits or, uh, you know, Barry's visiting. I got to get him on the guest Wi-Fi network. Like the things that, you know, left unchecked before people rain, they can just be really annoying. Like they can, you know, cause your whole day, you know, to come to a halt. And so we look at all of those friction points one by one. And we've amassed a large corpus of data about how the world does work. And I think we did a very nice job of, of packaging that into a set of about 5,000 pre-configured workflows that automate these routine tasks. So you get into work now and, you know, without having to moan about the things that you have to do but don't want to do, people are there to greet you. And it's available as a, a, a virtual agent. You can call it and speak to it. You can chat with it. Um, whatever you naturally would do when you need service, when otherwise you might email the help desk, call the help desk, et cetera, your people rain personal digital assistant is there to greet you and kind of automate away that friction. Um, so that's the, you know, the very pragmatic approach that we've taken to, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, save the next billion employees four to six hours of, of, you know, give them back that amount of time per week. Um, but it starts with a very, um, a very narrow focus on a, on, a, on a big problem that exists and just myopically you know, relentlessly committing to solve that problem. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we are regrettably coming towards the end of the podcast, but just before we do uh, end, still one more question from you regarding a general advice that you'd have for entrepreneurs. Um, you've had quite an illustrious career. So what advice would you give to someone who's yet to walk your path? Find your true passion. When you know that you found your true passion, you're going to wake up every morning and you can't stop thinking about that thing. It's the itch that you just have to scratch. At that moment when you feel like, I can't not do this, <laughs> you know that you've got it right. Entrepreneurship is a full contact sport. It's not for everyone. There are days when you feel like you're two inches tall. There are days when it's lonely. It's so important to be insanely passionate about the problem that you choose to solve because on those days when you feel like you're two inches tall, that passion that driving life force, that energy is what gets you through the days. And there will be days when you feel like you're, you're 10 feet tall and you can do no wrong and you're changing the world. And it is so worth for entrepreneurs who are really meant to do that thing. It is so worth it because that feeling of meeting the Yvonne, you know, that feeling of, you know, taking that, you know, spark in your mind and creating it into something that changes lives and that you can build a team around and a product and, you know, really feel like, you know, you're putting a little dent in the universe. That's why the world needs entrepreneurs. It's not for everyone. But I would say that everyone who was born onto this planet and was meant to be an entrepreneur, we need you because there are only a certain number of people who are crazy enough to do it. And, uh, you know, I think to paraphrase Steve Jobs, you know, the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who change the world. What a way to end the podcast on that final note. So Dan, well, thank you again so much for taking time to talk with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise, Barry. I enjoyed this. Thank you. That was Dan Turchin, CEO at People Rain.